In the confines of my comfortable, lovely home, today we're going to start a series of videos where we talk about concepts that come up in undergrad math, but talk about them in a way where you can understand them just if you're curious and have no undergrad math background, or maybe get more of an intuition of what's going on behind these things if you have seen them in the past. We're going to kick off with understanding what a group is. So you might have heard of the concept of a group, and today we're going to look at examples of groups, why groups come up in the first place, and an intuitive, nice reason to see the different amazing things that can come up with having the framework of a group to understand various parts of mathematics. So stay tuned to this video if you're really curious about what a group is, the intuition behind it, and getting our hands deep in understanding it. Hey, welcome to today's video, I'm Prof. Omar. So let's look at these two different phenomena that look different but actually act the same. The first thing we're going to do is look at rotation by 90 degrees clockwise in the plane. So we'll take any point x, y, and then it's going to map to the point we get by rotating 90 degrees counterclockwise, which is negative y, x. All right, and at the same time, we're going to look at the complex number i, which is the square root of negative 1. Now, if you raise i to the fourth power, that's i squared squared, which is negative 1 squared, um, which is 1. And if you take t and raise it to the fourth power, you'll get the identity because you'll be rotating 360 degrees counterclockwise, which is the net effect of doing nothing, essentially. Okay, if you look at t squared, then it's going to be the same as t is then negative 2, the inverse of t. They're both rotation by 180 degrees. And i squared is i to the negative 2 as well, because i to the fourth is 1. So the objects we're working with, the complex number and this shift of the plane, look completely different to the naked eye. But when we look at the details of operating with both of them, the mathematics we're doing feels the same. And so the idea behind group theory is to make a unified framework where you don't think about these things as separate, but you think of them as one. So now I want to introduce what a group is. The ingredients are a set G and an operation dot. And the operation has to obey properties that sort of we saw in the examples before. So the first part is if you have two elements of G, then the operation A dot B has to be something in G itself. Next, we have an idea of an identity. And we saw this identity in the two examples above, the complex number one or the map that does nothing to the plane. So the thing that has to happen with the identity is if we apply the operation to the identity to any element in our set G in any direction, so A dot G or E dot, or any element a, so a dot e will be e dot a will be a itself. So the identity doesn't do anything to any of these um, different objects in our group g. Thirdly, if we take any element in our group, we'll require a way to invert it. The inverse applied to the element we started with in either direction with the group operation that we have will have to be the identity. So you can think of this as like reciprocals in real numbers under multiplication, or when we add integers, it's like negation. And then lastly is this property called associativity, where if you take three elements in the set G, when you apply the operation to A and B and then C, it's the same as you applying it, uh, applying A to the result of B dot C. So this first property is called closure. The second one is having the identity. The third one is having inverses, which makes sense since we're talking about inverses, and this last one, like I mentioned, is associativity. So the real important ones in my eyes are numbers 1 and 3. 4 usually falls out um, in the different contexts that we deal with these things. So a quick example of groups is the integers, rational numbers, real numbers, or complex numbers, all of them, um, if you take them separately with their in addition and here the identity will be zero in each case when you add zero to anything you get that back and the inverses are the negative of elements so if you take an element a and you add negative a you get zero which was the identity element that we mentioned but what i want to do is give you an ex like understand examples that actually come up so the first one is what it feels like to actually do a group theory homework problem 
some of the ingredients here in this particular group are going to be the set being the integers and the operation is this funky operation here where a dot b is a plus b minus 2021. 20, and what we want to do is check that this is actually a group under this operation. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is figure out um, what the identity could be. So let's say a was the identity, then we'd have a dot b, uh, sorry, b is the identity, then we'd have a dot b is a no matter what a we choose. So a plus, my, uh, plus b minus 2021 20, would have to be a again. And that forces b to be 2021. 20, so that's our candidate for an identity. So let's actually write that down. So we'll let e be 2021. 20, then if a is one of these integers, we have to apply the group operation with a and e on other side. So a dot e is a plus 2021 20, minus 2021. 20, which is a. Okay, that's great. And then similarly, e dot a is 2021 plus the quantity a minus the 2021, which gives us a back as well. So e does act as the identity. It's a funny identity, but it works for this particular operation. And it gives us a feel what it's like to go through the processes of trying to figure these things out for a general group. Okay, now let's look at inverses. If I want the inverse of a number a, then I need the group operation with that inverse and a to be 2021. 20, so that means a plus whatever that is, we'll call it blank, minus 2021 20, has to equal 2021. 20, and if we rearrange, that tells us that blank should be 4042 40, minus a. So we have a candidate for what our inverse should be, and we should actually check. The operations will be sort of this, the, the, processes we'll go through will be the same as what we just did, but we should check just uh, to have a clear and concrete uh, proof of this. So if we apply a, the group operation to a with 40, 42 minus a, we get a plus 40, 42 minus a minus 2021, 20, which all the, together gives us 2021, 20, which is the identity um, in our group that we found out earlier. Okay, and a similar thing will happen if we reverse the order of these operations. 4042 minus a dot a will turn out to be the identity. We won't check associativity here. It's not too bad to check. And so you end up getting a group. I didn't check closure either. You can see if you take a and b being integers, the result you get, a dot b, will be an integer. So you have identity inverses. We talked about closure. We talked about associativity. And so we have a group. The thing here, though, is you get a sense of like what it might be to like to do a group theory homework problem, at least in the introductory part of a group theory course. But what are groups really good for? And in my opinion, they're really great for understanding symmetries of objects. So we're going to look at a particular example to get a sense of the power that groups have when understanding symmetries by looking at the symmetries of an equilateral triangle. So on the top left here, we have an equilateral triangle and the different symmetries. The first one is E where we do nothing. Then we rotate by 120 degrees clockwise. We're gonna call that rotation R, thinking about it as a function on the triangle. So if that's the case, then rotating twice in that direction, so rotating 120 degrees and rotating again 120 degrees, will be r composed with r, which we write with the circle. So we'll write that down as r squared. Okay, um, so there are these other different uh, operations. So this one on the bottom left is obtained from the identity by flipping across the axis that's drawn here in the dashed line. We're gonna call that s, so a reflection about that axis, that is a symmetry. Now we have these other two symmetries that actually can be achieved by composing previous symmetries that we see here. For example, if we take the result of applying r squared and then we flip across s, we'll actually end up with this uh, rotation, uh, this reflection here um, on the bottom center. And we'll write that as s r squared because we think about this as functions, right, with r squared first and then s afterward. Okay, similarly, the last thing will end up being s r. So these six objects, are objects that reflect the symmetries of a equilateral triangle. We see that r cubed rotating by 360 degrees is the identity. 
And S squared is the identity as well. Reflecting along, along an axis and reflecting again will effectively do nothing. Okay, so this group, this set of symmetries, is called the dihedral group, and we look, can look at compositions of the different elements to see what happens. It turns out that if you look at the actual symmetries, that Rs is the same as Sr inverse. And this is a fundamental relation that will allow you to figure out what happens if you apply a whole bunch of symmetries in a row without actually have to, having to move the actual objects. So for example, let's say we were wondering what happens if you apply R, uh, if you apply SR squared, and then subsequently SR, and then R squared. We can now think about this completely in an algebraic sense, an abstract algebra. We'll have R squared SR, SR squared. Now SRS is SR inverse, so we can re rewrite this as R squared S, SR inverse R squared. Now we can pair these intermediate things together. We have an S times S, which is the identity, and we have an r inverse r squared, which is r, and so this gives us r cubed, which is the identity. And so you see that the composition of all these different symmetries, we can figure out at the end being the identity without having to actually manipulate the objects because we have these abstract tools to allow us to do this. And that's what group theory really is all about. Now there's a lot more to group theory that extends to a lot of different areas of mathematics, but this example gives you a sense of why using this abstract formulation might be important.